Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming to the webinar. It's today's topic, uh, you all probably know, is why you're here. It's understanding and applying influencer marketing methods. So talking about how to reach bloggers and other influencers, since that's spread beyond blogging at this point. Uh, my name is Jim Tobin. I am the um, uh, founder of Ignite Social Media. We're an agency that does social media marketing for large brands. We're up to about 110 employees or so at this point, founded in 2007. Um, I also wrote the book, Social Media is a Cocktail Party, back in 2008. So if you want some dated social media advice, go ahead and get that for yourself on the Kindle. <laughs> I've lowered it to 99 cents, only because they, they couldn't let me make it free. So, um, so you know, four-year-old, uh, five-year-old uh, data. And then I have with me Jason Keith, who is the founder and president of Social Fresh. He thinks an awful lot about this stuff, has a great blog at socialfresh.com, and also hosts um, Social Fresh conferences. In fact, one coming up uh, in Tampa is Social Fresh East. Um, Jason, why don't you go ahead and give a plug for that? How's it going, Jim? Thanks for having me today. Fantastic. I'm excited about this topic. I, uh, I speak about influence a lot, I think probably more than any other topic. I think it's something everybody's interested in and everybody's trying to figure out on some level because it's got so much potential. But uh, we are doing the conference on April 18th and 19th in Tampa, sunny Tampa, Florida. Uh, we like to do our conferences near the beach. Our, our phrase is, social media is better by the beach. I don't know if that's true, but I think uh, any chance to get away and get into some sunny uh, beach coastal towns for a little education, a little social media training is a good one, especially up here in cold New York. Um, I'm sure it's a little warmer down there in North Carolina. but uh, Not warm enough. It's It's been way <laughs> too cold this spring, so I'm, I'm going to this. Uh, event uh, next month, and I'm I'm extremely excited about I it. I think so we need to smart. replace replace the uh, the groundhog this year because he he did lie to us pretty clearly about when spring was coming. So I'm disappointed in that as well. But uh, he did, good. and it's so scientific. You would it's shocking that uh, the animal <laughs> got it wrong. <laughs> clearly, clearly. Uh, but we're excited about the conference. Jim's going to be down there. Chris Brogan. Uh, we've got Jet Blue, Campbell Stoop, uh, Dunkin' Donuts. We've got a, honestly the best speaker lineup we've ever had. Two days. Tampa, Florida. Check it out at socialfreshconference.com if, if you're looking for a conference to go to in the next month. Uh, we're really excited about it, really excited to have Jim down there, and excited to be on the call today to talk about this awesome topic. So let's get to it. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll go back and forth. Uh, Jason and I will go back and forth. But we do want to get your questions since you're all in listen-only mode. So just send them via Twitter with the hashtag IgniteIM. Influencer marketing is the IM. Um, Ignite I am, and I've got uh, my friend Chris here in the room who's tracking Twitter religiously. He's got fancy advanced tools like TweetDeck set up, and um, <laughs> he will be feeding me those questions. So at the end of this, we're going to send you the deck. Uh, we'll send you the recording of it if you'd like to listen again. It's even nicer the second time. And we'll send you a copy of our white paper on influencer marketing to share with all your friends. So getting into it, um, 1983, Nike, influencer marketing, Michael Jordan. It's got to be the shoes money, right? I mean, that's <laughs> that worked. And that worked for a lot of reasons, but it also worked in part because it was a product of the times. Great and in commercial. 19, yeah, it was a great, great commercial. And you know, it worked for Nike. It worked for Jordan. It worked for the NBA. It worked for everybody. Um, but since 1983, a few things have changed uh, technologically. And we'll talk about celebrities and if, if and when they're still the right mode for social media marketers to use. Um, but really trying to get that same thing that Nike got, the, the halo effect uh, from an influencer is really what we're talking about today. We'll have five models, three that we feel are good, uh, uh, two that I, that I feel are bad, and we'll have a healthy debate on one of those bad ones, I think. Um, but let's start with the beginning. Jason, talk about, talk about influencer marketing. Yeah, this is a nice, uh, simple little diagram we have, Venn diagram. Uh, I use this when I talk about social media in general a lot. It, it happens to especially apply to influencer marketing. But if we break down the term social media, on one side of it, the social side, I like to talk about people, and people can be building community. It can be one-on-one -on -one customer service through Twitter. You know, Anytime where two people are talking, two or more people are talking to each other. And then on the media side of social media, we have the content. We have the blog posts, the emails you're sending out, the tweets, the Facebook updates. There's a lot of... Uh, convergence between these two things. Sometimes you're focusing on one or the other uh, in different aspects of community building or blogging, etc. Influencer marketing happens to fall right smack in the middle. And when we're talking about influencer marketing, we're talking about expanding our reach through the content of influencers, right? 
We're hoping that they'll blog for us. We're hoping that they'll tweet. They'll make YouTube videos. We're enabling them to do that. We're we're asking them to do that. Sometimes we're paying them to do that. But at the end of the, end of the day, we're we're amplifying the brand's reach through people that are going to be creating content uh, on behalf of the brand or the message or product. So Excellent. We've got, a, <clears throat> we've got some examples here, Jim. Are these some of your favorite examples of, of influencers or advocates? Well, yeah, there was a good blog post. I can't remember who did it, but Michael Brito, who's a friend of mine who's at Edelman now, and some others talked about their, their definition of advocates. And, and what was interesting relative to one of the topics we'll discuss today is that they defined advocates as people who voluntarily talk about their love for your product. Um, and and they all sort of define it as people who do it without pay. And so you know, pay yeah. is one of the one of the questions we'll get into today. Um, but just because they're so excited about North Carolina barbecue, which by the way is fantastic, I think we have some people from Kansas City on the line. If that tweet is uh, that popped up on my screen, is uh, Zena is on the line? <laughs> but I would say North Carolina barbecue is better. Well, than which Kansas which City. east or west North Carolina barbecue? Is I'm eastern or... personally, but yeah, that is a hearty debate. Um, and then you've got, of course, your Apple fanboys, and people get excited about Kickstarter. So those are wonderful examples of advocates, people who just like the product enough um, that they talk about it um, to their friends. But Jason, this is a this is a chart of yours um, that I found pretty interesting. Yeah, I think so. There's a there's a lot of words we can use here uh, to define, and you just talked about, um, you know, advocates. I like the the term advocates as a replacement in this chart for fans, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but I do want to say the words don't really matter. Um, we'll talk about the definitions. Focus on the definitions. Focus on these five strategies that we, uh, or the good ones that we define today, and what works for your business and what works for kind of your resources. So this is the hierarchy of influencers, right? These are the people that can influence your customers or your potential customers. These are the people that can move them to action. And that's kind of one of the best definitions of influence, especially online influence that we can look at, is people that can move your customers or repeat customers or potential customers to action, right? So remember what kind of action you're looking for. But at the end of the day, we've got friends. Now your friends might be your family. It might be your girlfriend. It might be your wife. It might be... Uh, your coworkers, we've got a nice funny coworker image there. You might not like all your coworkers, but you spend a lot of time with them. And these, this friends category of people that you spend a lot of time with, or you've spent a lot of time with them growing up, and they're going to be able to influence you more than anybody else in your life. Usually, they're going to have more influence the farther down on this uh, chart they are. So then we have fans, and this is uh, where the advocate uh, kind of category comes in. Most of these fans are going to be customers or potential customers or vendors or companies that you work with, people that are kind of stakeholders in the brand. And then you have publishers. Now, <clears throat> anybody on this chart can be a publisher, but typically when I'm talking about publishers, I'm talking about people that are not as close to your brand as um, the advocate definition that we talked about earlier. They're not necessarily going to talk about your company on their own behalf because they're passionate about it. They might know about your company. They might be connected in the industry. They might not know about your company, but the reason they're defined as publishers is because they have an audience. They have a larger audience. As we go higher up on this chart, they have a larger audience than your fans usually or than your mom and your, your significant other and your coworker, right? So, and then we have the last category, of course, uh, which we'll focus on on one of these points, which is celebrities. We've got Justin Bieber there. We've got Chris Brogan as an example as a blogger. That's Mike Volpe as our vendor, just to give a few shout-outs from HubSpot. Um, the key things to remember here is the higher you go up on this chart, the more people you can reach, but the less impact per person you're, you're typically going to have. Now, you might run into the fan club president of Justin Bieber, and he's probably hugely influenced by whatever Justin tweets. And honestly, if Justin Bieber tweeted about Social Fresh, we'd probably get like a nice bump or something. But if someone in my industry tweets about me or if someone that is best friends with my potential customer tweets about me, it's going to have a much higher impact um, from that person-to-person -person ratio, right? So the more influence uh, you have, um, the more influence is going to come from the people lower on this chart. The more reach is going to come high up on this chart. So what that creates in the middle is a sweet spot. And that's going to be our publishers and our fans. If we want to jump to the next slide, Jim. Um, we have publishers and fans consist of a lot of gray area. So Chris Brogan, for instance, is probably a fan of Ignite. He, he, I'm sure he knows what you guys are doing, Jim, the great work you guys are doing. Uh, he's probably a fan of Social Fresh, but he's also a publisher. Um, same for Mike Volpe. 
Now, some of your customers might be publishers, some of them might not. So the words that we replace publishers and fans with quite often, if we switch to the next slide, is advocates and influencers. <clears throat> now, there might be other definitions of these words, but this is how I like to look at it. Your fans are basically your advocates. You can get them to talk about your company typically for free with a little bit of work. So you have to put some elbow grease into it. You may have to make it easy for them to be able to share it. You have to give them a great product. You have to give them great customer service. And you're going you're gonna to in inhibit that ability for them to share your product, talk about your product, and help you get, bring more customers, more <clears throat> reach to your, to your brand's message. Now, influencers typically take building relationships, uh, uh, directed outreach, um, a little bit more focused work. Uh, sometimes it takes payment. Sometimes it takes payment in the form of money. Uh, and we'll talk about that. Sometimes it takes payment in the, in the form of access. Um, and sometimes it's just building a relationship with that person and offering them something relevant to what they write about or what they do videos about, um, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of options here. This is the sweet spot. Typically, when we talk about influencer outreach, we're really focusing on that influencer category, which is the publisher category. We're talking about bloggers, people with email lists, people with YouTube channels, et cetera. Yeah, and I think what's also interesting is this uh, in this chart is as you showed as it as it got smaller, the people had more influence on your life, and I think that's also true if you think about um, the topic. Uh, there's you know a bunch of different people listening now, and we have different niches that we're trying to influence. And I think the more uh, narrow um, your niche, the more likely a sort of smaller uh, voice, a less less well-known person, can have a tremendous impact on that community because they're so well regarded. Uh, in that niche, it's sort of the micro-famous concept that you know, um, you know, in data visualization, this one guy uh, from Facebook using Tableau software is tremendously influential, um, but you know, he's not going to be influential on you know uh, hundreds of other topics. Yeah, I completely agree. It's it's the relevance layer that we would put over top of this chart. Um, you know, if Chris was talking to me about uh, writing about you know WordPress plugins, I would listen to him. If he was talking to me about you know where to get a haircut or you know, where to buy a suit and tie, um, I might put less emphasis on that as I would my girlfriend or you know, somebody that I, I, I know has, has kind of a style knowledge or something like that, right? No offense to Chris's look at all. Um, but he, he has certain expertise that's, that's going to make a bigger impact than, than other expertise. I have the same thing you do, Jim, and, and that's a great point is that relevance layer is also very crucial. Absolutely. So to understand why, why people share and why people get involved, and this is true on a sort of a, a macro level with Facebook posts, and it's true on a more of a micro level with, with why would I write a blog uh, post about this, there's research from 1966 that I find highly relevant in social media by a guy named Ernie Dichter. Um, I call him Ernie. You know, we were close. Um, actually, I have no idea who he is, but the, I like the study. And what you see here is about a third of the updates come from people who just had such a great experience that they felt compelled to write about that. So it might be great service at a restaurant. It might be an interesting new app that you just think is fabulous, so you write about it. Um, that's about a third of the time. But I find what's interesting is that as marketers, we have almost no control over that. We don't design the app as marketers typically. We don't, uh, we don't control the service in the restaurant, uh, even if we market the restaurant. So we have to really work on the other sort of 67 percent of, uh, of, of sharing and that is very sort of self-involved. Um, self-involvement is um, I did this because I have inside information. Um, other involvement is I did this um, because I wanted to help somebody and, and I like the way that makes me feel. Message involvement is you know I share funny stuff because it makes me feel funny. I share breaking news because it makes me feel in the, new, in the know. And so on all of these sort of 67% that's left, figuring out the I in it. So if Chris Brogan is going to write about your product, why? What's in it for him? Um, and understanding that is, is really important and it's, it's really overlooked that Jason and I both have blogs. And so in addition to um, being social media marketers, we get pitched by other marketers. And um, the, the number of people who don't seem to understand this, the sort of uh, all marketing is exchanged, the sort of trade-off of why would I write about your topic? Just, hey, yeah. this is interesting, write it. They just ignore that. You find that? Yeah, I think, this, I think it's a great point. Another way that I like to uh, kind of reposition what you're saying is talking about the difference between the I and the we in ego, and that's you know a little deep talk, but basically when you're writing content, not necessarily how you're talking about, Jim, how it makes the person feel, 
but how it makes them look to their friends is what you really want to focus on because absolutely that's what's going to cause them to share it right so if they share something funny it makes them look funny if they share something really interesting and deep it makes them look you know really interesting and deep or really smart you know if they break news it makes them look in the know um, so you know it doesn't have to always be funny it doesn't have, always have to be breaking news but definitely consider when someone is going to share it, whether they're an influencer or a blogger or a customer when someone's going to share the content you're trying to get out there what does it make it look like to them friends because at the end of the day we all just want to look cool in front of our friends and if you can if you can help them do that then you're half the way there yep the sort of the sort of narcissism of social media comes into play here and it is just a fact so talking about some effective uh, influencer strategies starting with the first one and I think this is the one that people most often focus on and we, we basically call it the home run here this is the one that um, I think a lot of people pray for and that's if we could only get featured by and this really matters uh, really varies rather by your industry for us you know getting a getting a, a shout out in, in say matchable is a is a huge win for us um, because you know we do social media stuff and that's one of the one of the places they cover it used to be the only one but now one of the places they cover so um, when they write about our Samsung campaign as you know one of six you know innovative campaigns to watch that's a home run for us this is you know, people running around the office, people yamming it, um, tweeting it, all that kind of stuff. This is a home run for us. And you can substitute whether it's, you know, TechCrunch or a particular fashion blog or whatever you're trying to get into, you know, you can figure out who's your home run. But to do that, I think you need to think about what do they want out of it. And home run sites want to either break the story. So if you've got something new, um, you have to think about, you know, do you want to give somebody an exclusive? And, and this is an old you know, PR thing that we did back in, back when we were doing sort of straight media relations is do I want to get a big exclusive on the front page of one paper or do I want to get a smaller article in all the papers? And it's sort of the same kind of thing on blogs. You're going to get a bigger, a bigger single article if you let them break the story. Um, they also want exclusive access. So we know something that somebody else doesn't. And that's, again, about their own credibility, their own brand reputation. Um, and so, you know, we have a first look at the new Samsung Smart TV. Um, you know, before anyone else can see it at CES, that's good for a lot of sites. And the content has to be buttoned up and relevant to that site. And that's what missed in so many pitches we get is that, and, I, and you, see this in, you see this in all the big blogs complaining that they're getting pitched without it being um, relevant content and for a lot of sites like Mashable, Mashable is is uh, is makes their money on selling ads and so that's one of the reasons that I'm not picking on them it's a, it's, it's a good way to make money and you know Pete Cashmore's built a good business doing it um, but he's gonna want galleries that you can page through so a new traffic up a new uh, ad uploads on every page view and if you can understand that I think you increase your chance of, of getting your home run Jason I like that a lot. I think another step here is um, all these points are perfect, and we are talking about the PR side of influencer outreach here. You know, a lot of PR firms focus on this stuff, and and as we go into some of the other uh, the other potential um, ways to do influencer outreach, it's not as focused on just one outlet. But if you do go this home run direction, I think a step that you would agree with, uh, Jim, is is finding the right home run because Mashable might be right for you, it might be right for some companies, but it's not right for other companies to get a story there. It might not help them at all. You know, if you're if you've got a, a luxury customer or an older customer, um, they might not be browsing Mashable. I don't know. They might be. I have no idea what their audience breakdown is. But you want to definitely find that right home run and think about the people that are on that site, the people that are reading that newspaper, the people that are on that blog, and if they are going to actually be your customer and if they are there to talk about something relevant to your business. Absolutely. So, in talk about celebrities because their celebrities are often the the home run here and. You see, you saw it on, on Jason's sort of funnel there. They're at the top in terms of um, reach, but at the bottom in terms of influence. And this research got a fair amount of play about a year ago that Twitter celebrities hold no influence online, according to scientists. And, you know, I think there's, there's truth to that. I think, you know, uh, Justin Bieber's political views uh, aren't particularly going to motivate changes in voting behavior, for example. <laughs> um, and, you know, same with sort of Ashton Kutcher. Um, you know, generally speaking, he's not going to have influence on an awful lot of topics. I think, though, you 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 do see exceptions to this. Uh, one example: we were working with the Body Shop. Uh, we were introducing a new line of uh, cosmetics for them, and 
there was a tie into their their brand charity, which was for the year they were trying to donate a lot of money to stop child sex trafficking. And we had a sort of promotion going to raise awareness of child sex trafficking, and um, Ashton Kutcher tweeted it for us. Um, that is a, happens to be an issue he's cared a lot about, he's written about before, he's talked about before, he's tweeted about before, and so within about an hour, and this was, I, mean, I think this was 2009, within about an hour we had 10,000 um, people come visit our site. And the spike was directly in line with the minute he sent that tweet, and it died off, you know, an hour or so later. So he was able to send 10,000 people off over with a click of a, with a click of a button. But it doesn't mean, Jason, that you should chase that. Yeah, I think this is more of you know putting yourself out there in a lot of channels. You know, Ignite is and and you are Ignite on on behalf of the agency and what you guys do over there. Do a great job putting the brand out there. You also do it do a great job on behalf of your clients um, and I think you know just being out there in social media being on Twitter uh, having blog posts for them to land on you know just having a well integrated social strategy you're we're ready for one of these opportunities right you can't really hunt them down you know I know one time social fresh the biggest traffic day we ever had was when um, a journalist from Reuters shared one of our Instagram articles as breaking news because um, we'd identified something that was kind of new um, and we got a similar I think we got you know uh, 25,000 hits that day that um, that were fairly big for us and it's not something I would have done through our outreach it's not something I would have really built a relationship about it was just something that we kind of lucked out that day and we were prepared for it we had a lot of people sharing it you know we happened to have like a nice network of people sharing it in New York that were connected to this person and you know you just have to put it out there as much as best you can in a well integrated strategy and, and these opportunities will come back to you absolutely we got that tweet because one of the people on the team just, you know, forwarded to them saying, I know you care about this, thought you might be interested. It wasn't any big, long uh, exercise, and he saw it, and it was effective. But I don't think, you know, you want to build uh, the success of your program on getting, you know, uh, Usher and Pitbull to, to, to tweet <laughs> for you uh, about I mean, I don't think it ever, it never hurts, right? Makeup. Sure. Celebrities have a broad reach, and there's nothing wrong with sending messages to them. There's nothing wrong with trying to get, you know, Oprah to know about your product, et cetera. Um, but I think if that's your whole strategy is what we're saying, then you know you shouldn't be depending on just that one uh, that one key element to drop into place for for your influencer program to work. Yep. So the bottom line, do they have influence depends. Yeah. so let's let's talk about niche bloggers, which I think is is uh, is more common. So we're moving off the home run and we're looking for sites that are sort of um, in the second tier, and I count Ignite in that as as well. We're not Mashable. We're not, um, you know, a big fashion blog, and so we get we get pitched on these things all the time. And what I try to remind my clients is this reciprocal relationship that we're talking about. And bloggers really want content, credibility, backlinks, and traffic. And so we almost we have never, as an agency, sent an email to more than one blogger at a time, ever, 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 ever. And we never will. And the reason is it doesn't work. Um, the reason is you're not thinking about what they need if you're sending it to 10 or 50 or heaven forbid a thousand blogs at a time. So thinking about what they need in terms of content, credibility, backlinks, and traffic, you can uh, devise blog strategies that engage them as partners instead of treating them as news sources. I don't view IgniteSocialMedia.com as a news source. We don't try to break news. Um, we don't have breaking on our headlines. We write about what we think are interesting things to other fellow social media geeks. And so pitching me with breaking news is absolutely the wrong way to go. But if you take a minute and figure out what we write about, there's chances to guest blog, there's chances to get us involved in promotions um, if people do that, but they, they tend not to. And Jason, before we talk about money, do you, I think do you this find is, Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, I, the, one, the one thing I'll disagree with, and I think it's just probably uh, semantics, is that, met, you know, we talked about this earlier a little bit, but if you message 500 bloggers uh, the same email about your, you know, with your press release, um, you're doing several things wrong. Now, there's a chance people, it might, you might hit a few people that it is relevant for, you might hit someone that really needs something to write about that day, um, who knows. But if you really do want to optimize your time, you're going to be sending the one-on-one -on -one messages. You're going to be building relationships with the, you know, the sweet spot of the sweet spot bloggers that are both 
relevant to your industry and business that have a large audience and you know and know about your brand um, you, you want to focus your work right and that's and that's what I think we're talking about um, so I don't advise people send you know 500 emails uh, that are the same exact email to you know 500 bloggers I, I think you can see a little bit of success there I think what it, what that typically is 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 our first level of marketing which is lazy marketing um, you don't have time you have put something off you've got a big call to action from your boss or your client and you just you know you go to focus or you go to decision and you just push out a press release and you're gonna see much fewer results um, and if you go one one to one to all these people and tailor your request um, you're gonna have a much higher conversion rate of bloggers that that share the content you're trying to get out there and I'll also mention you know these are four great things content credibility back backlinks and traffic um, access is kind of a piece of that that overlaps some of the people mm -hmm. Um, I think access is a key thing that a lot of bloggers are looking for, especially if you're a larger brand that you can throw out there. And I think it's important to understand that each blogger is looking for something different. Sometimes they're trying to build their site and they need traffic and backlinks. Sometimes they've been around for a while, your link's not going to do much, but they really would love free content or, or the credibility of working with your business. So uh, as part of tailoring that, try to figure out what their specific motivations are because this is not always going to be all four of these together. Absolutely. And increasingly they want money. But we'll talk about that in a minute. So I'll give you a quick example of this. We worked with Radisson, turned 50 years old. They're our client. Um, and so we did 50 years, 50 days, 50 room giveaways, uh, 50 separate blogs on 50 days in a row. Uh, each gave away uh, rooms. And so we had to coordinate with, with you know, 50 different blogs. They all had to put it up on the, uh, this, you know, their day, and all 50 did, mercifully. Um, it, was a, it was a huge undertaking, but realizing what they wanted, um, we were able to get this done and as a result build you know a decent number of fans for the for the brand and to get those impressions uh, among people you know in these sort of so this isn't the home run this isn't on uh, Expedia.com this is on 50 sites like TravelMamas.com so raising awareness of the brand and, and the uh, you know the, the birthday among a wide number of blogs like this can lead to meaningful numbers awesome. so targeting has to be a win-win, and we'll talk about spray and pray uh, more in a second. Um, but the one I think that gets overlooked a lot when you think about influencer marketing is what I call a thousand bites at the apple. So what we've talked about a lot here is do your homework, figure out who's going to be an influencer for you, and uh, and then reach out to them. Um, but the other opportunity is to is to flip that and to let a lot of people do something. And so I, I've created my own law. Once you realize how simple it is, um, you'll you'll sort of realize why someone with my IQ could figure it out. But it's that the size of the brand's network is always smaller than the size of its network's network. So if you have 25,000 Facebook fans, or if you have 2 million, or if you have 20 million, great. But your network is still smaller than your network's network. So to the extent you can activate that network, you're going to be better off than just trying to preach to that network. So, you know, it's sort of that... You know, 16% of your fans see any given piece of content. Well, that's enough if if a if a reasonable percentage of them react to it with likes and shares and comments and you know retweets and social spread, because then you're talking about reaching potentially millions and millions of people. That's where it gets interesting from a numbers perspective, not as a broadcast. And so, to talk about some specific example of this sort of um, multiple bites of the apple, a program we did for Jeep where you could enter on Facebook or you could enter on Twitter to a chance to go to the X Games and, and potentially drive off with an Arctic Wrangler. You got extra um, entries for sharing, which is now not allowed on Facebook, so we do extra entries for sending someone back, so if they successfully click on your link, that is allowed on Facebook. So basically turning people into sharers for us as an incentive and then on Twitter entering you know with Jeep and with the hashtag Yeti dig and and turning those people into ambassadors we didn't know who was going to do it we didn't know which ones were going to be influential and drive traffic so we let everyone do it and sort of bubble up and as a result we ended up with you know 25,000 people sharing over 200,000 people entering a ton of new fans so instead of trying to think about you know who's our Chris Brogan or who's our Mashable or who's our 10 bloggers in this case we just went right to the community um, and and let anyone play along and that's that's to me that is influencer outreach because you know word of mouth is so credible another time we did a, we gave away a job and we had 800 bloggers enter which is a decent number but they sent 500,000 people 
to the site. So we didn't know which of those 800 would be the big ones, but you know they sort of stack ranked themselves. Some sent more traffic than others. Jason, what are your thoughts on the thousand bytes? Yeah, I love it. I mean, I think it's something you know if if, if Social Fresh sends a tweet out, you know, we make it a good click through would be like 200 people clicking on that on that link. Uh, but you know, some of our articles get shared uh, two, three, four hundred times. Some of them get shared a thousand times. Um, and you know, each of those per people tweeting it out um, is getting at least, even if they only get you know one click through, they're still amplifying our message much more than we could just on that one network. So I think it's you know the mathematics are are strong, and and the more you work to to kind of develop that audience and your fans and your customers, the the more responsive they're going to be in the future. Absolutely. So now we'll we'll talk about two uh, more debatable strategies. I think we'll have some debate on at least one of these, and that's sort of buying transactional content. So, paying bloggers. Here's an email that I got the other day. Well, I got this in September. Um, do you offer sponsored posts? How much for writing a review? You know, our client really wants to do this. I'm not impressed uh, by that kind of content. Um, the the uh, the other sort of uh, one that was popular uh, more so in like 2007, 2008, 2009 than today is Isaiah, uh, where you could pay people, you know, 25 bucks to, to write a blog post on their site. And to me, that was absolutely horrible. We did it one time with a client. Um, they asked us to try it. Um, they had an event coming up. It was time sensitive. We were able to measure the results of that from a traffic standpoint and from lots of other standpoints. And the, the results were a bunch of really bad blog posts on a bunch of really bad sites and I don't think it had any influence on anybody so I was not a particular fan of that but but Jason you have a slightly different take on this I'm a big fan of pain bloggers um, and I think just like any marketing channel there are really stupid ways to do it and there are good ways to do it um, so you have to you know you have to look at the same lessons we've been talking about you have to reach out to reputable people people with an audience, people that are relevant to what you're trying to, to the message you're trying to get out there. Um, and, you know, some bloggers uh, are very much a professional publishing platform or YouTubers or whatever the medium we're talking about is. Um, and they, you know, they work for money. Um, so whether they're selling ads, whether they're promoting their own products or whether they're getting paid to write, you know, they are getting... Uh, getting you access to an audience, and and sometimes that audience is good enough to pay for. Um, now, you know that it, the scale of that is drastic. So it's everybody, everything from this IZ example that you that you gave, where you can pay twenty five to fifty dollars to get on uh, all kinds of different quality of of websites and, and channels, all the way up to you know very very professional bloggers um, that command tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, to get access to their blog or their email list, et cetera, from very large brands. Um, I think anytime you do this, you really do have to pay attention to quality, relevance. Um, you have to vet these influencers just like you would vet, uh, you know, vet employees or people that are associated with your company. You know, uh, look at their history of content, look at the other people they work with, look at uh, the interactions on their website. You know, it's a process to go through, uh, just like anything else, and. You know, you're paying for people's time. You know, at, at the end of the day, influencer marketing takes time or money or both. Um, sometimes you put in the time to build the relationship. Sometimes you pay for it directly. You pay for it with money. You pay for it with products. You pay for it with access. You have to look at the full range. I'm not saying always depend upon paying a blogger, um, you know, kind of the pay-to-play per post style stuff, but um, there's nothing wrong with considering that option. You do have to, of course, disclose these things. I'm not saying you know try to hide it, um, but it's, there's nothing wrong with considering that option at all. Yeah, and I, you know, I you mentioned that in practice, and I, I think I think you're right. Um, I think um, I was thinking more of the examples of the email there and the uh, Isaiah experience that I had. And to be fair, I haven't used them since, so maybe they've they've changed uh, significantly, or or I have no idea. So. Um, <clears throat> but we had I Justine do some work for us with Samsung at CES recently. We had about 11 bloggers come in and do some videos with us for Samsung. We certainly paid them for their time um, and their travel and those sorts of things. So I am uh, I'm not necessarily I'm not against uh, having a fair relationship, um, but I am against this sort of 
uh, instead of spray and pray, which is the next one, spray and pay. Hey, I'll give anybody 25 bucks. I'll write anything uh, that yeah. I tell them to write. That's that's a disaster waiting to happen. Yeah, I mean, anytime you're, you know, people are going after low quality relationships. Period. It's just not going to have as much of an impact. Yep. So the last one is mailing the list, and this happens so much. In fact, this guy right here, here's his email address. Um, he emails me. He, I have no problem giving out his email because he has no problem abusing mine. So um, he emails me, you know, six times a week with some ridiculous press release that has nothing to do with marketing or social media or anything that I work on. Um, here's one where an erotica and sexuality website is donating to some place that I've never heard of because the people who go to that website have voted for it. So, um, yeah, I don't write about sex um, or philanthropy or sexual philanthropy. Um, I write about social media marketing, so I'm not sure why I got this other than I know I'm in the, you know, the Vocus and the, you know, the Cision databases and, and people just abuse them. The databases aren't necessarily bad, but the way PR people in particular think that we are media outlets and it's the same as distributing a press release in 1996 and give it to the widest amount of people and see who writes about it, absolutely not okay uh, from my perspective because if Mr. Gross here, Brian Gross, had a reasonably good um, thing to pitch to me, I won't even open his emails anymore. So he has damaged his personal brand and his corporate brand by abusing that database. And uh, that's why I think these mass emails are just a huge mistake. I never knew the I never knew the niche sexual philanthropy existed, so Yeah, well maybe influencer there, I don't know. Somebody could buy the sexualphilanthropy.com and really get a tremendous blog going. I mean, so so again, just to be devil's advocate, you know, this the spray and pray the, the email out to 500 people. Um, there is a chance it could work for you, but it, it is uh, just to repeat the lazy the first you know, the first step of marketing, which is the laziest way possible. You know, instead of building relationships, instead of looking for relevance, they're just buying a list, paying for access to that list, and and sending out a press release that they've already you know put together. They're not even customizing the messaging for for email. Um, so it's you know the results are going to be very low quality, if at all. Um, so you know it's it's more of an advertising channel than anything, and it's not really a great advertising channel. Yeah, J Jason, tell us the tell that the quick case study that you shared. Um, early yeah, this morning. I mean, I have heard. Uh, there's, there's. I've, I've been approached by one PR company before that kind of defended this practice. Um, and what they said is, they'll buy a list. You know, something that they think is, you know, gives them somewhat of a, a little bit of relevance because they're getting it from Focus or Cision. Um, so they'll, they'll buy a list on technology uh, for a technology client, and they'll email out 500 people two or three times, and they'll get, you know, anywhere from one to five percent of them to respond and cover the issue. So you know maybe you know maybe it's a product level thing of of you know this client is only paying us you know five thousand dollars for this project so we're gonna just do this spray and pray approach because we know it'll give us back kind of a one to five percent return on coverage um, they treat it very much as an advertising channel they measure the metrics like they would advertising um, and you know they they believe that it works to a certain degree they know that if they spent time reaching out to all five hundred people with customized uh, customized messaging that they would get a much higher response, and they probably charge more for that. Um, so you know, there's a level of of defense that can be that can be put behind this kind of spray and pray approach. But I think it's a short term win at best. I think long term, you're taking chances with with the client's reputation, with the agency's reputation, with your personal reputation. You know, you're potentially making yourself uh, open to uh, spam issues by getting labeled as spam. Most of your emails are going to get deleted. Um, you know, deliverability issues in the future for your emails and stuff like that. So there's a lot of things to consider for this, and a lot of the long-term value is sacrificed for uh, a fairly insignificant short-term win, I think. So um, while there is probably some uh, some arguments to the contrary, uh, I think it's usually just when you're considering short-term versus long-term instead of vice versa. Yeah, and I think if, if uh, you know, some of our clients ask us to email press releases out, and so we've We've done it. We still do it one at a time, but we've done it, and and we'll see you know pickup of one to five percent depending on how good the press release is. But when we try to engage bloggers to participate with us, we can get eighty percent 
uh, participation. So I think if I were going to do this um, repeatedly where I have news I need to announce and get picked up in sort of a journalist model, I would spend a lot of time with my database segmenting the sites that cover news um, versus the sites that don't because that yeah. would be a good starting point. I think that's good advice. So we did get a question on, uh, on Twitter from Adrian. I pay bloggers with our product, which is Saki and Spirits. So does that really count as transactional? Um, first of all, Adrian, I do write a tremendous amount about Saki and Spirits. <laughs> um, and we're at 14600 Weston Parkway in Cary 27513. Um, I would be happy to uh, transact with you. Um, but but uh, you know, product um, usage, I think, is, um, is uh, is, is, is completely fair game, I think, for a couple reasons. Um, one, it is a form of compensation. Um, and um, like I said, I, I was trying to make the distinction between this sort of $25 for anyone who writes and, you know, and will you, uh, and, and being fair with people's time, bloggers' time. And so I think product is, is fair game, um, you know, to whether it's, because you also get that, that review. And how can I be an influencer on your Saki product if I've never tried it? How can I write about this, you know, the Radisson if I've never stayed at one. So um, I, I don't have any particular problem with I think that. it's a great, a great thing to do. And, I, you know, it's obviously it's easier for most companies to share a product or a service um, at a discount or for free than it is to uh, pay someone. I, I mean, I, I know I worked for a retail company, and I needed to start a blog for that retail company. This was five years ago. Um, and I didn't have any budget to pay bloggers. I didn't even have free product to give away, but I did have coupon codes. So I had, you know, probably tw at the end of a couple months, I had about 24 bloggers um, giving us content for the retail site blog um, just for a, you know, kind of an insider's discount code. And I think it was maybe 20 to 30%, but it was something that they were passionate enough about and it was good enough for them that it worked out. So I think there's all kinds of um, potential uh, transactions, rewards, uh, trade that you can look into. Um, at the end of the day, if it does have a monetary value, you do still have to disclose it um, or encourage the blogger to disclose it um, or require them to disclose it. You know, I would definitely say consult your, your legal team on these issues, but um, there's, that doesn't mean it's not a good strategy. I think it's a great strategy to look into for most companies. Yeah, and keep your questions coming as we as we finish up. That's why I jumped to this slide, so you can either tweet at Ignite SMA or again use the hashtag Ignite I M for influencer marketing. But um, FTC disclosures, the way we handle that, because the FTC's clarified this recently, we we uh, put at the bottom of all of our emails to bloggers the the reminder of the rules and that it would be both the FTC's expectation and ours. Um, but then you know the FTC did clarify we were doing this anyway, but they clarified that that's not enough. Um, you can't just put some boilerplate at the bottom of your pr of your presser of your uh, email contact. You have to um, double check and see if they've written anything um, and that they disclosed it. And if they have not disclosed it, you have to make a best effort to contact them and encourage them um, to um, to disclose it. So there is a bit of follow up here um, that you need to do to uh, make sure you influence you uh, insulate yourself and or your client if you're with an agency. Yeah, and one, one other detail on that that they, uh, they gave some more specificity to is they want disclosures to come at the top of content. Um, so if that's a blog post, they want it to come at the top of the blog post or um, near the link that is you know, kind of being paid for or traded for or near the endorsement that's being paid for or traded for. Um, so putting something at the bottom of a blog post, for instance, uh, or at the end of a video is less, um, is not recommended uh, by, by the FTC now. Uh, and their reasoning for that is clear. You know, you can leave in the middle of a blog post, you can click a link, you can stop playing a video after an endorsement, you know, and, and not see uh, any disclosures. So Jason, a question I'll, I'll let you take first. What, inf what about influencer tools like Clout or Cred? Um, should we pay attention to them? Yeah, I mean, I think so. I'm a big fan of Clout. Clout gets a lot of um, kind of vitriol from a lot of different people. And it's, it's similar to everything else we've talked about. You know, in my opinion, tools are not bad. Uh, what you use those tools to do is potentially amazing or really stupid, right? So if clout is your entire strategy um, for something, you know, it's probably not the best strategy in the world uh, because you're not getting any personalization. But clout can be a great awareness tool. You know, I, I went to uh, up in here in New York, the Samsung uh, new smart TV launch the other day, and they probably invited, I think, 400 influencers, quote-unquote, uh, from New York City uh, to this 
big party for Samsung, and it you know it introduced me to Samsung Smart TVs, things I didn't know about. Um, I got to see Flowrider do a little rap performance. You know, it was a cool event. Um, it was sponsored by Samsung. I probably have a higher positive association with that product and the brand now. Um, it didn't get me to buy a TV, but you know, I'm talking about it right now to you know a few hundred people probably. So it's 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 varying levels of awareness conversion. You know, the whole marketing funnel. It's just it's just a question of working these tools into a full strategy. Um, so you have to think about what they're good at and what they're not good at. You can't really build a relationship through clout. You can't introduce a brand. You can introduce a product through the service, and you can do a little bit of targeting uh, through the service. Um, but you're going to be able to do much better targeting um, and much better relationship building through kind of hands-on, one-on-one emails, tweets, Facebook, etc. Um, so I think it's just it's just a, it depends on what part of your marketing strategy you're working it into, what part of your social media influencer outreach strategy you're working into. Some of the new tools I think that are really cool uh, to look at, or some of them not as new as others, but uh, SEO Moz bought Follower Wonk, which is kind of a Twitter, um, a good way to sort people on Twitter into into different categories, different niches. Um, Little Bird is a new one, uh, fairly new. That's really good. Uh, it's a paid service that kind of allows you to sort um, bloggers and people on Twitter and, and uh, uh, YouTube into kind of really well computer algorithm uh, categories. Um, and I think you can trust it a lot more than you could like a cloud or a pure index that will give you people by category. But Little Bird uses a lot more kind of uh, math behind it and, and comes with some great insights. Um, none of these should just be lists that you take and run with as your pure strategy, I don't think. Right. We, we've used CRED um, for some programs. We did one uh, for Jeep where we helped. We wanted to find influencers who like, who talk about Jeep and write about Jeep in a particular geographic area, which to do manually would be incredibly intensive. Um, and so what they were able to do was narrow the list for us um, to say, here's, you know, 30, 50 people to start with. And we were able to dig down and find the five that we were, you know, hoping to work with. So um, we found Cred to be a great partner uh, for that. So yes, I would pay attention to them, but like Jason said, it's the beginning, uh, not the end of a program. So Abigail's asked, what social media measurement tools do you use to monitor or measure engagement? Um, you know, that, that's a, there's a there's a lot of answers to that. I think the most uh, one of the most common answers is is Radian Six. Um, it's a little more expensive than some others. On the lower end budget is sort of Tracker, T-A-R-C-K-U-R, uh, which is a significantly less expensive. Um, but um, the the other thing you know we'll do is we build most of our most of our lists, with the exception of those things I was just discussing with Cred. We build most of our lists by hand, um, and then we cross-reference um, various sources um, such as. Um, uh, clout and uh, cred, and even to a degree, um, uh, compete, which is uh, can be wildly inaccurate for small blogs um, and and potentially large ones too. But um, definitely yeah. for small blogs um, to try and build our own list. But but those are some of the ways we do that. But in terms of monitoring and measuring, um, Jason, what would you add there? I mean, when you're monitoring and measuring anything on the internet, Google Analytics is a great tool. I think you have to decide your your KPIs um, or you know just just decide what your tracking strategy your measurement strategy is going to be ahead of time and be ready to track it so if that's you know how many visits you got to a web page via Google Analytics or tracking links that you give to bloggers um, or you know uh, tracking links that you use through social media um, you know just make sure you have the system set up to track it ahead of time Google Analytics is is by far one of the best ways to track anything online um, you you can also just do manually manually go through and say these bloggers covered it, these bloggers didn't. Um, you can manually go in and look at your Facebook, um, you know, increase in engagement or your Facebook increase in fans based on a baseline that you prepare before the campaign, so you have something to compare it to. Um, so you have to plan that ahead of time, and I think there's a lot of great tools out there. I I'm a big Google Analytics uh, fan. Um, as far as social media tracking, uh, Jim, you mentioned some great tools. I'd I'd add uh, Simply Measured in there. I think it's a good one, especially if you're a data geek and you want to get into Excel. They export everything into Excel for you uh, through Simply Measured. Um, so there's a lot of great tools out there. It's it's a question, you know, if you're going after, if it's for an author, for instance, you might be doing stuff on Amazon 
Facebook.com and trying to get more reviews or more likes or ratings there. So there's, it's completely dependent on what you're doing, and you need to kind of dive in and see what those success metrics are going to look like beforehand. Right. So we have time for two more questions. So we'll start with this one. Which influencer program is better, the one with a few people with high scores or a lot of people with limited influence? Well, let's start with that, Jason. Um, well, again, it depends on your uh, business objective. So if you're going for awareness, um, especially for maybe a consumer product, which needs more broad awareness, you, you might want to get a lot of people talking about it uh, to their close friends, right? If you're going for something that's more focused of a topic um, and you're, you're in a smaller niche or smaller industry, I think a few people with large audiences uh, could really help you out and, and get you kind of a similar bump. An example of that would be uh, the uh, Universal uh, theme park that they opened up for Harry Potter um, down in Florida. Uh, they launched that by giving seven Harry Potter bloggers that they spent a long time researching and finding um, access to basically the press announcement. They basically had a private webinar for these seven bloggers uh, to announce the Harry Potter park. And you know they were going after a broad consumer audience, but they knew that these seven bloggers had such large focused audiences on this specific topic that it would uh, behoove them to really give them access and credibility like we were talking about before and let them share the stories, let them have you know the first questions, um, you know, give them assets uh, to share that nobody else would have, and it worked for them. I mean, and the story spread from those seven bloggers all the way to national news coverage, um, and they got a ton of coverage for it. Uh, so I think it depends. I think it depends on the industry, the topic, the the business objectives. I think both are firm strategies. I think you also have to look at your resources. Sometimes you'll have the resources to build like an amazing Facebook tab that can that can help people share on a large scale a lot of your fans, and sometimes you don't. But you might have the time and resources to talk to, you know, ten influencers that have larger audiences and build relationships with them. Yeah, and it really depends too. What what do you what do you have to offer? Um, uh, to those people. So, um, yeah. you know, in that case, in the Harry Potter case, they had something to offer. For a lot of brands, they struggle with what to say. That's really interesting um, to these influencers that's not already out in the news. And when you're with that kind of a thing, when you have nothing to say that's really exclusive or interesting, then you sort of got to go with the lots of people, you know, playing along more than the, the breaking news. On the flip side, if you've got a new product, I saw the guys who developed Thirst, the, the app, the sort of news app. Um, uh, that got covered in Mashable. I, I met them at South by, and that Mashable article was tremendous influence on their business. Um, and so, yeah. getting you know a new product in a niche community, the home run was great for them. A big product like Jeep, talking about a you know a, a new release of uh, Arctic Wrangler, uh, you know, better for lots of people to to all talk about that. So it it really depends. Last question, what key metrics should we use to measure ROI of influencer marketing? That's Chris's question. Chris, last month's webinar was on the measuring ROI. Um, I would say before I answer this, to go to our website, we have a white paper there that you can download, six models for measuring ROI. But my first question would be if, if a client or your boss or somebody is asking you this, I would ask them to... I would tell them you are completely comfortable developing an ROI model for this, um, but you would just like them to share with you the PR um, ROI model that they that they use every month. So you could put it in the same format that they're used to seeing, and I guarantee you that they will not send that to you because they don't have it. Um, and so I would I would start by resetting expectations, but then I would go back to what are we trying to influence, which is you know ROI is a specific number. But are we trying to influence backlinks? Are we trying to influence? Um, we will use this. What does the first page of Google look like for the the term about your product? And you know, we've had examples where number one is the client because it should be right, and then um, and then we've had three or four reviews that we've helped get done, sort of stacked there on the first page, and that's uh, tremendously valuable to the client because you've got a link to the product and you've got this social proof that we've sort of um, stacked into Google. Um, you know, for people who are considering the product, so that can be that can be a tremendously valuable thing. But there's there's dozens of ways to measure, depending on what your goals are. Yeah, that's a big question. I'm glad you guys did a webinar on that last month because that deserved its own <laughs> its own webinar. And it it the answer to as it is to many questions is it depends. Yeah. Um, so you you can be going after conversion and selling you know x number of products. It can be going after lead generation. 
It can be, you know, SEO focused, like you were talking about, Jim. It could be just, uh, you know, if you're comparing it to a PR, uh, it can be just impressions. If you're trying to get out there on a bunch of media sites, it could be how many impressions did you get, how many outlets covered it. Um, so it just depends on you. Got to you got to measure that against business objectives and against, you know, honestly, what your boss wants at the end of the day. Absolutely. And that webinar I did with Tom Webster, who, if you know Tom, he's wildly smart. So I've heard of him. Yes. He's, uh, he's going to be joining us down in Tampa next month at Social Yes. Media. Yes. So, so as we wrap up, I'll get that plug in again for Social Fresh East in Tampa, <laughs> April 18th and 19th. In Tampa, if it, even in North Carolina, it's cold right now. So wherever you are, you should be going to Tampa in three weeks. So talk to your boss. Um, tell him you need to join Jason and I, Tom Webster, Jay Bear and lots of other interesting people. Um, it's going to be fun. We've got a great crowd. It's going to be the second time we do our Fresh Storm interactive brainstorm event. Uh, it's going to be, honestly, our best event yet. I'm looking forward to it. It should be great. I look forward to it, too. And for everyone on the line, thank you all for attending. We will follow up with you with a copy of the white paper um, and the recording if you want to share it with uh, friends and relatives. It makes a great holiday gift. Um, in the meantime, we'll keep in touch. We'll have more webinars every month, and hopefully we'll catch you back uh, on one of these in the future months. Thanks so much for attending. Jason, thank you. You were an excellent, excellent panelist. Thanks, Jim.